ready to turn your Bibles, if you would, to Philippians chapter 3. And the title of the message today is Full Disclosure. Full Disclosure. And the resurrection of, of Christ is full disclosure because He is everything that He said that He was. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the, the Savior of the world. He's the, the Son of God who came and died on the cross for your sins and, and rose again on the third day. He is everything that He said He is. And that, it's full disclosure. And it is evidenced by the empty tomb. It's evidenced by the fact that He was seen of over 500 people. It's evidenced by that Mary Magdalene uh, encountered Him. It's evidenced by the fact that of disciples' courage. You remember, they were up and hiding themselves, afraid for their life, and they were hiding. When they uh, met the resurrected Christ, it changed them. They were willing to die uh, for Him. Uh, somebody might, they won't die for, if somebody knows a lie, it's a lie, they won't die for a lie. They will they'll die for something that is truth. And so we see that. It's evidenced by that, but it's also, it's evidenced by the fact of changed lives. My life is a life that has been changed by Jesus Christ. And it's evidenced by the fact that the church is alive and well. Um, and you know, no matter what you think about the church and your thoughts about the church, the very fact that the church is here is a fact of the evidence of Jesus Christ that He rose from the dead. But it's also evidenced by the life that Paul had and the life that he was changed. And so I want to preach to you today about the fact of about how Paul was changed by the resurrected Christ. And so Paul tells us here in verse 10 of this chapter, chapter 3 of Philippians, he's going to give full disclosure about his life and him following Christ. But listen to what it says in verse 10. It says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. So now he's given, uh, he's going to give us full disclosure what that means to him. And that word full disclosure is kind of a, it's scary to some people because full disclosure means that you're required to reveal uh, something uh, completely about something. And Paul is about to do that as we go on. But listen to verse 12 as we go. Again, this is Philippi, Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 going down to verse 14. It says this, Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And so he's going to give full disclosure in his assessment about his life. And that is coming from verse 12. Let me read verse 12 again to you. Just this first part, I'm going to break it down into two parts. But he says, Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. So it's kind of a surprising thing that you see here that he is uh, making a confession. This is a godly man. He's not confessing that he's, he's got sin in his life. He's not confessing that he's not been living right. What he's saying to you or to us is this, is that he is confessing that I have not got as far as I need to go. I've not matured to the point that I need to mature. And this is a guy, now think about Paul now. Paul has led many people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul has started churches. He started churches in, in, in a lot of different areas, a lot of cities. He's reached many cities with the gospel. But Paul is saying this. He said, I have not got to where I need to be as a Christian. In fact, that word perfect means to reach the goal or fulfill a purpose. It has the idea of a man being coming to full maturity. So Paul is saying, I myself have not got to the point where I am fully mature as a Christian, I'm still growing, I'm still learning. And so if Paul says that, if Paul, the one that's wrote many of the books of the New Testament, the one that 
that we look at and say, wow, what a man of God he is. If he is saying that, surely uh, the rest of us have to be honest in the assessment of ourselves, especially as, as Christians this morning, and say, you know what? I got work to do. I need to still be growing in my walk with Christ. And there's reasons that you need to continue to grow. Because one thing, it glorifies God. When you grow as a Christian, as you grow in your walk with the Lord, you begin to glorify God. It also enhances your witness. Think about the people in your life that you want to talk to when you have an issue spiritually. It's not the people that don't never go to church. It's not the people that, that cuss every breath. It's not the person that you see at the bar every week, and I'm covering all that stuff. So, oh, no, you go in there. Let me just say this to you. That's not the people you go to. The people that you go to are the people that you know love Jesus and you see it in their life. And so that's why you need to continue to grow. But also, it produces joy in your life. When you live in for the Lord and, and go, doing all you can for Him, what a joy it is to lay your head down at night and say, wow, amen, amen. But also, it protects you from backsliding. It's hard to backslide when you're going straight for Jesus. Amen. And so here you have uh, Paul. He's saying, I've, I, I'm making an assessment of my life. But also what it does, this too, I saw in that, it's kind of surprising, but it's a safeguard because it keeps you from, you have the attitude that Paul has. And here's a guy that could have great arrogance. But when you have the attitude, you know, I still need to keep growing. It keeps you from having spiritual arrogance. You ever met anybody like that? Everybody, y'all don't want to say nothing, do you, right? <laughs> but you have met those people. It keeps you from being complacent in your life when you keep wanting to grow. You know, I know if you have a, if you have a child that's not growing, you always say, man, there's something wrong. You take them to the doctor. Is that not true? And you say, doc, there's something wrong because they're 15 and they only four foot tall or whatever. They, they, there's something wrong here. And because you want to get them checked out, something's not, they're not growing like they should. And that's why you need, if you're not growing like you ought to, you need to be talking to the great physician that you would be healthy in your life. But then is another thing as I go down, and then before I get to this next point is this, is that as you assess your life, as you give an assessment of yourself, it's not for you to be assessing everybody else around you. Because, see, this message is for you. This is God, in His Word, speaking to you about your life. Not for you to assess somebody else and say, well, the guy across the pew over here, he, he needs some assessing going on in his life. That, that's, it's about you and Jesus. But another thing that, that, that Paul goes on to say here, he gives full disclosure about his aim. And that's coming to the back part of verse 12. It says, but I follow after that, but I follow after it that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Jesus Christ. So he's given full disclosure about his aim. He's saying, I want spiritual ma maturity. I want to grow. I want to mature in Christ. I don't want to just get by. I, I don't want to just get by. I don't want to be just mediocre. I don't want to just be another person. There. I want to be everything that God wants me to be. And as a Christian, that ought to be our, our desire, it is to mature and be all that God wants us to be. You don't want to stand before Christ one day and, and, and him, him stand looking you in the eye and you say, well, I, I wish I'd have done more. I, I didn't know if this was going to happen. I didn't know it was going to be this way. Yeah, you do. You know you're going to stand before Him one day and you don't want to stand before Him. Not being all that you could be for Him. And so Paul says yes, but I follow after. And that word, that, that phrase there, follow after, it's a Greek phrase and it's talking about, a, about like a runner who is, who, who is pressing with all their strength to get to the go. He said, I want to get to that. I want to grow and be what God wants me to be. I want to be all that God wants me to be. So it's got that, he says, I'm following after, I'm pressing. And the Bible compares our Christian life to a race. Listen to Hebrews 12.1. It says, 
Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. There's a lot of different thoughts about who those witnesses are, who that, that cloud is, who is looking at that. It says, But let us lay aside every weight in the sin with us so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. That's a whole other message. I can't really get into that part of it. But what I can say to you is this, is that Christ is, is telling you and telling you, the Word of God is telling you that your life, your, your life for Him is like a race. And He said, you should be running to it. So Paul is saying, I want to grow, I want spiritual maturity. That's my aim. I'm giving full disclosure. I want to grow. I want spiritual maturity. And then also, He says, I want to stay the course, is what He's saying. And so, our salvation is is the starting point of the race. And the race is not a sprint. It's the marathon. You've probably heard that. Some of you have heard it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. But what happens is many Christians live their life that like, it, like the, the Christian race, the Christian life is like a sprint. And they start out living for Jesus and they're on fire for Jesus for a little while. But then all of a sudden, they fade out. And they're not, you don't find them no more. You don't see them at church anymore. You wonder what happened to them. Let me say to you that the Word of God is telling us that, that it's a marathon. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a race. You've got to continue on. And Paul's saying, I want to stay the course. I don't want to fall off. Listen to what Galatians 5, 7 tells us. Maybe you don't find yourself in this verse. I hope, everybody look this way a second. I hope you don't find yourself in this verse I'm about to read. Listen to what it says. Galatians 5, 7. Ye did run well who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth. So they, they were running at one time. They were running a good race. They were really living their life for Christ. But sometime, somehow, they got off track. And then Paul goes on to say, as he says, I want to struggle forward. I want to do everything I can. Listen again to this. It says, that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Now, I want to tell you something. Listen to this right here. Listen to what this verse is saying. It says, that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ. So why should you make a continuous, all-out effort to live for Christ? Because listen to what he says that I may apprehend. It means that I, that I want to, he said, I want to lay seize on, I want to grab a hold of all that God has for me because God has grasped me and he's called me, he saved me and he's got a purpose for my life. And I want to live that person purpose because God's got a purpose for every person here. And he's got a purpose just for you. And he, Paul is saying, I want to grasp all that God has for me. Because God loves you, and he knows what's best for you. And he's got your best interests at heart, and he's got a plan for your life. And he's got a purpose for your life. And Paul saying, I want to grasp what he's got for me. He's got the best for me, and I want to grasp. I don't want to settle for the trash of the world. I don't want to settle for things that aren't the best. He's saying, I want to grasp what God's got for me, and get what God is doing for me. And I want to grasp and do everything that Jesus wants me to do. And I want to be everything Jesus wants me to be. So I want to know, is your, is your life counting for Christ? When Paul comes to the end of his life, he could make this statement. Listen to 2 Timothy 4, 7. He says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. He said, I have fought a good fight. And I know you might not believe it. I used to take karate, and I got pretty, pretty good up there. I couldn't do a split or nothing right now to save my life. But I will say this. When I was going to tournament, I was fighting I was going to beat you up. I mean, I'm going to fight a good fight. I, you know why? Because I didn't want to leave. Even if I got knocked out, I was not going to 
walk out of that and not have put forth my best. If even if I didn't win that particular thing, I was not, I was not going to go look in the mirror and say, you know what? I wish I'd done better than that. I wish I'd have put forth a better effort. And Paul was saying this, I've fought a good fight. I've ran that race. He said, I've done everything that God would have me do. I, I can look, I can stand before the Lord and say, God, I, I've done my best for you. And I, as, as, a, as a man of God and somebody that loves you, man, I want you to be able to stand before the Lord and say, God, I, I fought a good fight. I kept the faith. I, I ran the race just like you wanted me to. Uh, don't you get tired of just seeing folks that, that are just going through the motions? That's where the devil wants you to be. The devil, he doesn't want you to be on fire for the Lord. He doesn't want you to live your life for God like God wants you to live it. He wants you just to float along and, and, and just float along and one day you die and you're going to stand before the Lord. That's all he wants. He doesn't want you to really be on fire and really be living for God like you ought to. Then Paul goes on to give further full disclosure and he does it with his actions. He said, this is how I'm going to do it. He says, I'm going to show you. He said, I've, I've told you about my my assessment of my life. He says, I, I showed you my aim. He said, now I'm going to show you the actions I'm going to take to do everything I've just told you about. And that's coming out of verse 13 and 14. He says, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now, I use King James Version. And as you look at 13, I don't know what version you might be seeing. You see in the King James is up there. But where it says, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but you can take this out because that's not in the original. And that I do is not in the original. What it says is, in the original language it says this, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but one thing. He says there's one thing. And so he's going to tell us about his focus. He's like a, a specialist. He's like an Olympic athlete. He says, I'm specializing in this one thing. And that one thing is that he may know Christ and make Christ known. That's it. I want to know Christ. I want to get closer to him. I want to be all God wants me to be. I want to be all God wants me to be. And I want to make him known. How is he going to do that? First thing is this. He says, I'm going to forget the past. Brother, I count not myself to have apprehended but this one thing, forgetting those things which are behind. We can look at the past, and we can learn from the past, but we can't live in the past. See, because if you live in the past, you can never go forward. You see, I'm going to break down some things. I'm going to give you about four things about the past and what the past can do to you. But see... Forgetting, he says, forgetting those things. He's not talking about obliterating it. He is talking about not allowing the past to hinder him from doing all that God wants him to do. And see, this is a man, now listen now, this is a guy that was burning churches. This is a guy that was killing Christians. If anybody can tell you that I'm going to forget the past and I'm going to move forward, Paul was right there with you. And see, all of us have a past. If I could tell you my past, it would scare you to death. And I would probably be scared to hear your past. But you, can't allow, you cannot allow the past to hinder you. Because see, some people are paralyzed by the past. Many of y'all know who Lot is. And if I say this, you, know who, you don't know who Lot's wife is, but you do know that Lot's wife turned into what? Pillar of salt, right? And so they were told, she was told to do what? Go forward. Don't look back. You go forward, don't look back. Go forward, go forward, don't look back. And this is coming out of Genesis 19, 17. It says, And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, Escape for thy life, look not behind thee, neither 
Say thou in all the plain, escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. Verse 26 of that same chapter says, But his wife looked back and from behind, and she became a pillar of salt. She's paralyzed forever now. Because she looked back, got stuck in her past, and didn't go forward. See, some of us are in here, some of us listening online, are, are, are allowing our past to paralyze us. We're afraid to, to move forward because I made a mistake sometime in my life. I, I mean, I messed up. Pastor, you don't know how bad I messed up. You don't know what it is. I don't have to know. But I do know that Jesus Christ loves you and he'll forgive you. And if you'll bring your past to him, he'll forgive you if you want forgiveness. And if you want to be freed from the paralyzation of the past, God will set you free if you let him. But then sometimes people are, are prevented from their past. See, now she can't, go, she can't do nothing. She's paralyzed and she's from preventing herself or she prevented herself from ever doing anything for God. And that's really what we do to ourselves. But here's another thing. Everybody, this is so, everybody, this is so important. You're gonna, this is going to help you right here. Everybody look. Sometimes people use our past against us. Paul, you remember when he was trying to come along? They were afraid of him because of his past. I don't know if he's real or not. I don't know if it's, he, he, he's acting like it. I mean, I don't know. You sure you want him to be a part of this? You sure? And they was afraid of him because of his past. And But sometimes people will, will try to use your past to, to put you down. And the devil is definitely going to use your past to, to smack you down as much as he can. And it always happens when you try to really start living for God, what happens? You remember how you used to be? You think you can serve Jesus? Boy, if that church finds out how you used to be. Let me tell you something. It doesn't matter how it used to be. It matters how it is right now in your life. And God will forgive you if you will ask Him. If you will ask Him to forgive you, He'll forgive you. You ever just driving down the road? And you're just by yourself and, and you're driving and all of a sudden something terrible you've done just pops in your mind. None of y'all, maybe it's just me. Wow, I must be terrible. <laughs> but anyhow, that happens. And you go, where did that come from? You know what I always say? That's under the blood. I can move on. God, forgive me for that. I don't have to. I, that's past. I'm not doing that. That's not me. That's not who I'm. I'm not that guy anymore. I'm not him. <laughs> the only reason I laugh, I remember after I started living for the Lord and I met a guy that I had had a past with and I saw him, he come in and, and we entered, we'd come together and I said, he said, ask me, he said, he used some explicitives or whatever, he used some cuss words. How the blank blank are you doing? I said, man, I give my life to Jesus and I'm preaching now. He turned white as a ghost, <laughs> turned around, walked out the store, didn't even buy what he was going to buy. And I thought, it freaked me out. I thought, and, and I thought, but how bad was I? But I'm so glad I'm not the man I used to be, that he forgave me. And I'm here to tell you that God will forgive you if you allow him to. If you bring your, your past to him, bring it to the Lord. But then there's a thing, you ever heard this? They heard the thing where it says, I want to give somebody their props. Sometimes, not, it's not in the negative, but sometimes our past, we've done some great things. We had some great victories. And sometimes we sit back and we sit on our laurels and feel like we don't have to, you know, we, 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 we've, we've, we've arrived, we don't have to do nothing now. And that's where the devil wants you to be, to where you don't want to go forward. You can't stop. My, my father-in-law, he's passed away, he's in heaven now, but he was... 91 years old, still preaching every opportunity he had. 
he didn't look at, he said, I'm not retiring. He wasn't pastoring, but he was still preaching. And in his, in his mind, it was, you know, I'm, you know, God called me to preach. He never, never, he never said, don't, he never said, stop. Christian person, God called you to live for him. He didn't say, stop. Having great victories is a great thing. And you can, you can look back and say, man, I'm glad God did that. I want to rejoice in that. But today's a new day. When the manna came, it came every day. God blessed them with manna, amen? They got the manna the next day. They didn't, they didn't just live off the manna the next day. It was fresh the next day. And it's fresh for you. Paul says, in verse 13, he says, I'm going to go forward now. He says, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. And that phrase is talking about as the guy's getting near. Y'all have seen those in those uh, races where it's real close. And they do this right here. They, they stick out the chest so they can get to the finish. Now, you've seen that, right? Or they do whatever they can do, or they dive to it. And Paul's saying this right here. I'm reaching forth to be all that God wants me to be. I'm going all the way for Him. I'm reaching forth. He says, I'm reaching out. And what that means is this right here. As Paul was saying, I'm giving 100% effort to all that God has called me to do. To be all God wants me to be. And I wonder, would you say, I hate to use a percentage thing, but how about you? I mean, if you're thinking about yourself and you were assessing yourself, what well, would you say, man, I'm, I'm not giving 10%. I'm not doing much at all. Then he goes on to say this, not only am I going to reach forth, I'm going to do it with fervor. He says this in verse 14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high, high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And that press means to earnestly pursue. So he said, I'm really pursuing this. He says, toward the mark. He means I'm bearing down on that mark. And that word mark right there, it has two meanings. One of the means, it means that you're going for that. You see that goal in the distance, and that's where you're headed. But it also means it's a reference to the person that's in charge. And so Paul is saying, if you're looking at it in that second uh, uh, definition, Paul would say, I'm pressing down. I, I'm, I would fervor. I'm, I'm going forward, and I'm going straight towards Jesus, is what he's saying. Paul says, I'm not looking back. I'm going forward. And so, Paul refers to it as a high calling. And Jesus did not go to the cross, die on the cross, shed His blood for you, and raise the third day so that you would be just like the world. Did you hear what I said? Jesus didn't die on the cross, shed His blood. He shed it to pay your sins. He did everything for that, not for you to live in the world, to be of the world. He done it so you would be different. The Bible calls us procure your people. And that's the way you are. So don't listen. Don't cheapen your life or your walk with God by allowing the things of this world to pull you down in it. In the sin of the world. And you say, well, I don't see people do it. I'll give you an example. I've, used, I've seen this many times while I use it. You can watch something and they'll interview a Christian. And the Christian, they'll ask them, a, they'll ask them a step, what do you think about whatever sin there is? And the person, they say, I'm a Christian, they'll say something like this, well, I'm a Christian, but... That but, what comes after is going to be terrible, I'm just telling you. That's going to be of the world. Because it should be, I'm a Christian, and this is what God says. It's not, I'm a Christian, but... I'm a Christian, and I'm not allowing the things of this world to pull me down. Because listen, treat your relationship like the precious thing that it is. It's a high calling. Amen? Look at me. Treat your walk with God 
and Him grasping you and loving you and calling you for a purpose, treat your relationship like the thing that it is, the high calling. Amen? Amen.